Well, welcome to a brand new series called A Way Out. And I don't know if you're looking for a way out, but there's a way out. Uh, not out of the building right now. You've got to sit here. <laughs> uh, no, we, we want to talk about the prophets, actually, in the older part of the Bible. And I want to give some context before we jump in, because we're going to look at the prophet Hosea today. Uh, but before we jump in there, let me give you some context of what prophets were doing all about, what their job was, and how it's even uh, divided in Scripture. In Scripture, when you get in the older parts of the Bible, you see there's a whole section, they're called the major prophets, and they're particularly long. We quote a lot of them during Christmas and communion moments. They've got a lot of of the Messianic uh, Scriptures, the ones that talk about the soon coming King, Jesus coming. But we're going to, on this series, we're going to be focused on what we call the minor prophets. And they're called minor, not because they're minor in significance, but because of the brevity of the books. They're small. And I've highlighted the books that we're going to deal with in the series. We're going to look at Habakkuk. We're going to look at Jonah, Obadiah, Joel. And today, we're going to look at Hosea. But let's start by talking about what is a prophet. What was their role? Why did God even use them? If you want to understand the prophets, there's really two roles they had. The first were, they were the chief reminding officers to the children of God. They constantly were reminding them about who God was because apparently they kept forgetting. And if you look through the prophets, any of the prophets, they all have the same themes. There's four major themes that the prophets kept reminding people about. They kept reminding them of God's love, God's judgment, God's faithfulness, and God's redemption. Over and over, the major prophets, the minor prophets, same message. God's love, God's judgment, God's faithfulness, and God's redemption. Now, the first three have to do with God's character. God is love. God is just. God is faithful. Now, why would the people of God need someone to remind them about who God is? Because they're a lot like us. They kept forgetting and kept fabricating. They kept forgetting who God was, especially in times of prosperity. When things were going great, they kept forgetting who God was, and they kept fabricating a version of God that fit the lifestyle they wanted to live or fit the appetites that they might have at that time. So they kept forgetting and forgetting, and we're we're, we're fabricating, uh, forgetting and fabricating, sorry, we're a lot like that. As one theologian said, he said, we often end up with a domesticated version of God, a manageable deity who fits, fits neatly into our pockets, a fabrication, available when needed, silent when not. We, when we make God in our own image, and this is why the prophet Isaiah would say this, and he'd remind us, you're the clay, he's the potter. He's the creator, we're the creation. If you can make a God that likes the same people you like, hates the same people you hate, wants the same things you want, allows the same things you have an appetite for, well, that's not a God, friends. You can't create God. God is God. He is king. And instead, we either come alongside him or we can't fabricate him. But the children of God kept trying to do this. So they were the chief reminding officers. They'd show up and occasion God would raise them up to remind them this is who God is. He is love, he is just, he is faithful, but also they were the chief directional officers. You notice in that list, the first three deal with God's character. The last one, God's plan, a redemption plan. Now, it's interesting. This means that in every one of the prophets when you read, and sometimes you need to hear this because the tone can feel a little like pointing fingers because the prophets were calling things out. But in the middle of this, there's always a thread of hope. Always a thread of hope. There's always landing and redemption. And that restoration, whatever it is that we need restored, often comes to this word that's powerful and hard for us to stomach in 2024. It's the word repentance. We're going to visit that at the end of our teaching just to understand what that looks like. But these, these prophets were always pointing to a way out. And here's the problem, and this is what our series is going to be focused on. We might know we need a way out, but how many of us are determined to take the long way? Anyone been there? Took you a long time to come to a place where you acknowledge God. We, some of us are just bound and determined to do the long way. Some of us are really determined to do it our way, aren't we? I'll, I'll come, I'll, I'll do this, I'll, I'll bow a knee, or I'll, I'll come to God as long as it's on my terms, right? 
Some of you are like me. I had to learn the hard way. I don't know what it is in me, but there's something in me that sometimes just had to learn it the hard way. The hard part is when you see people walking the wrong way. And that's what we're going to be looking at today with the book of Hosea. Because it's really a story about the children of God looking and walking in the wrong way. Now, it's interesting. When you get lost in the woods, have you ever been lost in the woods? Some of you are so you're Torontonians, so maybe you're like, I don't know what the woods are. Well, I've been lost in the woods, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But, you know, they did research on people who were lost in the words, woods. Why did they take the wrong path the wrong way? And it's interesting. They came up with the top four reasons they do. Number one, often when people are lost in the woods, they take the path of least resistance. They, look, they find a pathway, and it's the least physically demanding and they follow it, even if it leads them deeper into the forest and getting lost. But that's in each of us, isn't it? We crave comfort over challenge, don't we? There's something in us that wants comfort over challenge. But following Jesus, he's not so interested in your comfort as he is in challenging us to change, to become something. Remember this, that sometimes in life, we want the easy way, and when we feel and experience a hard way, we think God can't possibly be in it. But God's refining fire purifies us, not the culture's air conditioning. It's not about the comfort. It's in those places of challenge. Pastor John Arpberg says it well when he says, God isn't working at producing the circumstances you want. God is at work in bad circumstances to produce the you he wants. God has this incredible way of using all things to work together for good, even the stuff that's tough in our life. How many chapters of my life have been so hard and God used it to chip away my pride and my ego and all of the stuff that I like to prop my life up with. And he took it away, and that was a gift. So sometimes it's the path of least resistance. The second thing they noticed, people got lost, and I love it, must have been all men. Some of them had maps, but they thought they knew better than the map. Anyone ever done that? Like, I, I use Waze in my car. I, I sometimes do not trust ways. I'm pretty good with directions, and I feel like that ways keeps putting me in traffic to keep me off the side roads that could be shortcuts. And I'm always in Toronto traffic looking for shortcuts. Anyone with me? How many times has ways been right, though? That's the problem. Sometimes we're given a map. God gives us this map. And it's filled with all these cautionary tales of people that chose their way over God's way. All these cautionary tales. And this is why the psalmist would say, he'd say, God's word is like my phone flashlight on in the dark. It shows me the way forward. So there's a map, but it's only as good as if you use it. Sometimes we have this false confidence in life that we know how things should go. And often we get applauded for that confidence in this culture, in this world. And that's why sometimes even you can dismiss some of God's map because it feels like, ah, oh, that was for a different era. Be careful. What is the thread that applies in 2024? So, yeah, uh, path of least resistance, ignoring the map, two more. One is, some people react in panic. Darkness begins to fall, and they feel like if I just speed up, I'm going to find my way out. And so they begin to run. And they often run deeper into the darkness. They run deeper into the wrong way. Something about fear, something about anxiety that begins the peak and we begin to get running. I, I was thinking of in Exodus chapter 32, the children of God have left Egypt. They're going to the promised land. They camp out at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments. You know the story. And he doesn't come back for a long, long time, it feels like to them. They begin to panic. What do they do right away? They fabricate a God. They fabricate a God to meet them where they're at, at least a God they can get their hands on, at least a God that they can make, at least a God that will be present. How many times, friends, do you panic when you don't see God coming through the way you thought he would? When you don't hear his voice like you wish you heard it. And when in our panic, we begin to take matters into our own hand. We begin to fashion something that's obtainable, something that we can grab hold of. And the last one is that they found that people that lost, sometimes it was because they were following the wrong guide. And I loved how the researchers called these people. They called them charismatic wanderers. I love that. These are people that people meet in the woods, they're lost, and they claim to know the way out. 
and they speak with extraordinary confidence. And so people followed them into getting more lost. I, I got lost when I was a kid. I'm in the woods. We were in the woods all the time as kids growing up. This is pre-cell phones, pre-internet, pre-your parents caring where you are. <laughs> and I'm lost in the woods with my older brother, Peter. And Peter was so confident he knew the way out. I should have known he knew nothing, nothing. We got more and more lost. Finally, we stumbled on some road. Thank you, God. And we began the long trek home. Uh, some, it, it, throughout the New Testament, Paul warns you over and over. He's telling you there's going to be lots of people in life. They talk with such confidence that they know the way. And he says, be careful. He says this to a church in Corinth. He says this. Don't be fooled by these fake influencers. People who act like they're repping Jesus, but are actually total frauds. No surprise, though, even Satan shows up looking like a good guy sometimes. It's so true, friends. Like an angel of light. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Be careful, even with confidence. Sometimes there's people speak with such confidence and authority. Be careful, friends. Always measure it against the map. Is this where God has determined us to walk in? What does that look like? So the prophets, this is the role of the prophets. You're going to hear it throughout our time together. You're going to hear us talk about God's justice, his faithfulness, his love, and redemption, because that's what the prophets spoke of. They're the chief reminding officers, and they're the chief directional officers for the people of God. So let's look at our first prophet, the prophet Hosea. It's a fascinating story. It happens in the 8th century BC. Let me give you some context. The children of God, they've wandered. They have wandered from God. In fact, they have begun fabricating deities. And I would say they're not even that creative. They borrowed them from their neighboring uh, neighbors, the Canaanites. They, the prophet, or the god Baal, they followed in this season. There was a lot of adultery going, uh, idolatry going on at this time. And the prophet, or the god Baal, demanded there was uh, temple prostitution attached to worshiping him. There was even human sacrifice in times of trouble. And Hosea stands as a living parable and example of how faithful God is to his people, even when they are unfaithful. And he stands up, and he is the chief directional officer and the chief reminding officer of who God is. So the story begins with a wedding in chapter one. It's a beautiful thing. It starts with a wedding. So this is kind of where it gets, it gets right out of the gate, it's controversial. Scholars often find this so incredibly difficult to stomach because God asks Hosea to do something quite scandalous here in the opening chapter. He asks him to get married. Here's how the narrative goes. God comes to Hosea and says, Hosea, I want you to be my prophet to speak to my people and remind them of who I am. And Hosea is like, I'm your man. That's what I do. I'm ready, God. He loves God. He fears God. He's going to do whatever God asks him to do. So God says, okay, in order to do that, I want you to get married. Hosea said, amen to that. <laughs> Bumble didn't work. I've been looking for someone that will love this prophet because prophets aren't easy to hang out with all the time. You know, prophets are always telling it like it is. You don't always want to be around people like that. So amen to the type of woman that will have my back, will encourage me in the faith. You know, we'll do things together. We'll pick up hobbies together. We'll have coffee and park, walk, uh, walks in the park in between my moments where I'm in the face of the Israelites. But he said, okay, God, where do I find this woman? And God says, and this is where it gets a little scandalous, God says, the red light district, down at the strip club. And Jose is like, God, you know, I don't think I heard you properly. I think my mind was in the wrong place. I thought you said the red light district. And God says, I did. Oh, well, but God, what, what is my future wife doing down there? Oh, she must be there doing good. She's helping people, isn't she? She's, she's there on mission, isn't she? And the story picks up in chapter 1, verse 2, and it says this, The Lord said to him, Go take for yourself an adulterous wife, a children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery and departing from the Lord. Whoa! I want you to go marry someone that you know is going to be unfaithful. 
that's going to betray you. God is saying that I want your marriage to be a living parable of my relationship with my people. I want you to marry someone that you know is going to be unfaithful, is going to betray you, is going to cheat on you. And you and I are going to give our hearts. I'm going to give my hearts to my people. You're going to give your hearts to this woman. We're going to give our hearts to people that are utterly going to betray us, reject us, hurt us, break our hearts, because your relationship with this woman is going to mirror my relationship with my people because I am like a man whose wife has been unfaithful to him. Whoa. There's so many metaphors for who God is in Scripture. God is a rock. God is a consuming fire. God is a king. God is a judge. God is a shepherd. And here God is saying, if you want to know me, if you want to understand me, understand my heart, you have to see me as a husband whose wife has left him for another lover. All the pain of that, all the hurt of that, all the anguish, that's what I experience when my people turn away from me and sin against me. I mean, friends, you know, drop the mic moment. So God takes Hosea to a woman named Gomer of Diblian. Says it in verse verse three. Says, Hosea married Gomer, daughter of Diblian, and she conceived and bore him a son. Guys, just, again, we read these texts and we're like so removed from it. And it feels like, okay, he's just doing what God said. Can you imagine the talk in the town? Could you just imagine what was going on here? Here's Gomer, that the only thing she's consistent at is being unfaithful. She's been unfaithful with everyone she's ever been with. She has a series of betrayals in her wake. This is exactly who she is. She has just broken people's hearts, left, right, and center. And God takes him to her and says, marry her. And he does. I can just imagine the chatter of the, of the church mamas, right? Can you believe this? Do you know, does he not know who she is? He's a man of God. Gomer, what? Okay, I just love it because, you know, people would rather talk about people than talk to people. That's just kind of how we are a little bit. Other churches, not us though, not us. We're, we're all principled in the way we handle this. But I can imagine the talk that was going on. And it doesn't take long. Gomer is unfaithful. She bears him three children and at least one of them is not his. How do I know it? Because Hosea names his last child Lo-Ami, which means, in Hebrew, not mine. Can you imagine? Uh, Hosea, who are your children? Well, this is Jenny. <laughs> this is Ravi. Not mine. <laughs> like, like, talk about in your face moment. She's, she's unfaithful right out of the gate. And this reminds us, this wedding reminds us of the weight of God's love. Friends, if you love, you're going to suffer. Every parent knows that. Every partner knows that. If you truly love, there's suffering attached to it. And Hosea knows when he marries Gomer. He knows that his reputation will take a hit. His credibility will take a hit. His heart will take a hit. His life is going to take a hit. He knows what he's getting into here. And friends, you and I are Gomer. I often think of what it cost me to follow Jesus. Do you? I think about the things that it cost me. I can experience rejection. Have you ever experienced that for following Jesus? I certainly experience sacrifice because as a follower of Jesus, you're called to sacrifice. You're called to sacrifice by being someone who's generous and giving. You're called to sacrifice by putting a towel over your arm and serving the people around you. You're called to sacrifice to obey because obedience is a bit of sacrifice, right? Because often uh, by obeying, I'm doing things that I don't want to do or I'm not doing things that I do want to do. So there's elements of sacrifice in it. There's also pain. Because how fun is it to not turn, to turn the other cheek to an enemy? How fun is it, hard is it to forgive those who've hurt and harmed you? But we're called to do that as people follow Jesus. So I can count the cost. Jesus said, count the cost if you're going to follow me. Hey, if you're going to follow me, just know what you're signing up for. But have you ever paused to ask yourself what it costs God? To get a relationship with me? Friends, think of the hits his reputation takes when some of his children 
get on social media. They just blurt and they're angry and, they, and then someone is saying, isn't that one of your kids, God? I think God wants in those moments to say, low a me, not mine. <laughs> but he doesn't. He doesn't disown us in that. His reputation takes a hit. Think of the weight of carrying me, prone to wander, having to call me back to himself over and over again. Think of the, I just think of how I tend to love what God gives more than who God is. You ever been caught up in that? You know you're in that when, you're, when God doesn't come through in a way you think he should come through. And then you judge him. It's more about what he gives then than really who he is. I think about how I have an attraction to shiny things over faithful things. I think of how, what it cost him. It cost him his son. Man, it's expensive having children, isn't it? Every parent knows that. How expensive is it for God to adopt us into his family and call us his own? So the, the, the scene changes from the wedding. In chapter 2, it moves into what you could call the, the marketplace or the red light district. Hosea, as soon as he marries Gomer, he has his kids. Gomer's predictably unfaithful. She leaves him. And we don't know where she goes right away. We don't know if it's a brothel or she's just living with someone else. But it records some of her words in verse 5. It says this, I will go after my lovers. So, you know, 100% consistent. Who will give me my bread, my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. I'm going to get what I need, when I need, from whom I need. And then it says this. This is the words of Hosea. But she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine and the oil, her silver and gold, which they used, they being the other man, used for Baal worship. What's going on here? Well, this is an amazing scene. Evidently, Gomer's left him. Gomer's with either in a brothel or she's living with another man. And this, all, I, all we know is Gomer's not being provided for in this moment. Uh, there's some measure of abuse that's going on in this moment. And how does Hosea know it? Because he's been walking the streets looking for her. He's been knocking on doors trying to find her. And when he has, he sees her, he calls her back to himself. Come home with me. Come home to the kids. And instead, he notices in that moment, because she won't come, that he's, she's not well. She's losing weight. Maybe her face is sunken in. We're not particularly told all of the circumstances around this. But he won't stop pursuing her. There's this old, it's like centuries old, a poem called The Hound of Heaven. And I was going to read it to you, but I thought it's, the language is so old, it's hard to understand. I love the reflection by Richard Rohr. He's a Franciscan monk. And he says this about God, because God's likened to being like a hound of heaven. The hound of heaven never loses a scent, no matter where you go. Even in our deepest denial and greatest shame, he follows us. Wow. He follows us, always offering grace. And so is Hosea, following his unfaithful wife, offering grace to her. But she doesn't respond. The story goes on because you can see it in there. Somehow she's being provided for, but she doesn't even know that it's Hosea. The scene is probably like this. Hosea finally finds where she's at, knocks on the door. A man comes to the door and he says, are you the man living with Gomer of Diblian? The man says, yes, I'm living with Gomer. Who are you? I'm her husband. And I imagine he probably recoiled thinking he's going to get one of these, right? Instead, he grabs his hand and puts money in it. And he says, I know you're not taking care of her. So I'm giving you this money so you can care for her. And I'm sure when that door closed, that man was like, what a fool. But he took care of Gomer. And they actually used the money. She used the money on her lovers. She used the money to worship Baal. And all the while, she thinks it's her lover sustaining her. And it's Hosea that is sustaining her. My friends, how many times have we been there? How many times did you think all the stuff you have and where you're at in life is because of your hard work 
Who gave you that body that could work that hard? Because of your smarts, who gave you that mind that helped you? I wonder how many times that I've wandered from God, he protected me from some devastating circumstances in the end. All the while he's sustaining me and I think it's me. I think it's somebody else that's taking care of me. And it was God all in the background putting money in the hand of the unfaithful lover of mine or whatever that is in your life and sustaining us. In fact, in Hosea chapter eight, he speaks about it, about Israel. He says this, I took Israel by the arm and I taught them to walk, but they never acknowledged my help. I sent healing after healing, but they didn't even know it was me. I led them with my ropes of love, gently guiding them, easing their pain. I lifted them like a baby to my cheek and I bent down and fed them and they didn't even know it was me. Friends, that's why gratitude is something that's so powerful in the believer's life. Every time we say thank you, we're acknowledging that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Every good and perfect gift in my life has come from God. Oh, but Jonathan, you earned this or you did this. Yeah, but I, I, I know who gave me the abilities to do that. And by acknowledging it, your hand will always be open to his hand. So Hosea is sustaining uh, Gomer here and she's unaware of it. She's thinking, this is great. I got a maid. I got all the food I want. I have enough for my lovers. I have enough for Baal. Uh, and that's all in verse eight. He doesn't, she doesn't realize he's keeping her from death, but God knows his wife. God knows that, that she plays the harlot and he still loves her. And this is good news for all of us. So one of the most beautiful scriptures is in chapter two, verse 14. This is what it says. Again, she's done all of this and then it says this. Therefore, this is Hosea talking, I'm gonna go and I'm going to allure her I'm going to lead her into the wilderness. I'm going to speak tenderly, tenderly to her. Words of love, I'm going to woo her. Does she deserve this, friends? I grew up in a church, and I know it was well intended, but it was nothing but an angry God that was always looking to judge me. I, could, I knew God is love, but I lived God as judge. And I spent my whole youth and young adult life trying to earn my salvation, trying to earn it and trying to, and, and you know, the scripture says all of those good deeds, they all fall short of his glory. And friends, this is why I'm committed as your pastor to remind us over and over, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's not the slap, it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And sometimes the kindness is correction. Sometimes the kindness doesn't always feel good, but it's always kind. It's loving. He speaks tenderly to us. Listen to him so he can speak tenderly to you. Humble yourself so you don't have to be humbled. This is the point where he, she finds herself in this place and he determinatively turns to her to woo her back. Ah, this is great news, friends. God knows you. God knows you and he still loves you. God knows his church, and he still loves his church. I mean, that is good news. I mean, depending, if I was in a church that, you know, was you know, a Pentecostal church or something, someone would say, thank God, or amen, or anything like that. But, you know, but that's for a different church. Okay, so then it moves from the red light, it's from the wedding, the red light district, and the final scene is in the marketplace. Something happens here in chapter three, and it shows us the cost of love. Hosea supplies for Gomer. I want you to know in the ancient culture, he's free of all of his obligations at this point. He doesn't have to do anything for Gomer. He, she is the one that's been unfaithful. She, he has already paid and sustained her. He owes her nothing. She can, he can move on with a guilt-free conscience. But then these words from God. Say it out loud with me if you would. Go show your love to your wife. What was that word? That's how God is with us. Again, 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 and again. Go show your love to your wife again. 
So it says in scripture, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethka of barley. This was a confusing verse, but let me explain it because most of us don't know what a homer and a lethka is, an old measurement. It's not a homer, it's not Simpsons, but it's 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethka of barley was about nine bushels, which was about 15 shekels. So he bought his wife back Now, why does he need to buy her? You'll see in a moment. For 30 shekels. 30 shekels in Hosea's era was the exact price of a slave. Something has happened to Gomer. She has fallen very low here. She is either, one of two things have happened. Either a lover has sold her into slavery, which is a possibility in that culture, or she has racked up debts. And if you were, you were an indentured slavery. And here's what would happen in the marketplace. It would be a public public auction for the slaves. So here is Gomer being sold. Just imagine the day. Because there's something probably very sobering going on in her heart and mind. As they pull her up at the front And the crowd is gathered around, and they're going to bid on her. I imagine Hosea shifting into that circle, and somebody saying, isn't that Hosea's wife up there? And somebody seeing him and saying, that's your wife. And he says, yep, and I'm here to get her back. And all of a sudden, you hear a man yell, 15 shekels. And he says, 17 shekels. And I imagine Gomer, who's looking down at the ground, undoubtedly, looking up because she knows that voice. She's heard that voice before. Scanning the crowd, looking. 20 shekels, she hears over here, another man. 21 shekels, it's Hosea. 28 shekels, finally, 30 shekels. And he buys her back puts his cloak around her to clothe her. And he says, let's go home. Let's go home. Who doesn't want to hear those words? Let's go home. You think about, Hosea had to stand in the humiliation of that moment. And Gomer had to stand in the humiliation of that moment. Jesus knows how that feels. Paul would say to a church in Philippi, when the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Why? Well, look at what it says in Isaiah. The prophet says, he was looked down on, passed over, a man who suffered, who who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him and thought he was scum. He humbled himself and stood in the place of humiliation so that we could be raised up. I think of the fact, and this is the story of Hosea, Hosea, we're all gomers. We have all sunk so low, and if you don't think you have, you're not ready to experience really God's love. If you think somehow your, your riches or your status or your abilities or you're somehow cleaner than somebody else, friends, all of us, the story of the gospel is everyone has sunk so low we had to be bought back. Everyone had to be bought back. And here's the price. You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. 30 shekels. Huh, way more than that. How valuable were you, friend? You were purchased. Who were you purchased from? Go, remember this with Gomer. Gomer wasn't purchased from a slave trader. She was purchased from the consequences of the decision she made in this life that put her in that position. We are not purchased from the evil one. He doesn't own us. We are purchased from sin and death and condemnation, the fruit of the decisions that you and I have made. And I'll tell you, he spent a lot on you. Look what Peter says. He says, God didn't drop some spare change to save you from that pointless, messed up life you were living. He paid the ultimate price with Jesus' blood. It's way more valuable than anything this world can offer. He stopped at nothing 
to spend on you to buy you back to himself. So the prophet reminds us in 2024, we're going to pray in a second, God's love is aimed right at you. You might feel like God can't possibly love me. I don't love me. You can't stop him loving you. It's like a freight train coming at you 100 miles an hour. Try to stop it. You will never stop God's love towards you. He loves you and he even loves the people you hate. He is a lover of our souls. And then God's judgment, it does demand a justice. And that's why we needed to be purchased. God's faithfulness, it never ends. Again and again and again, he pursues us. You know, we sing that song, Reckless Love, and I got to tell you, the first time I heard it, I did not like it. I'll tell you why I didn't. I didn't like the adjective reckless attached to love of God. But that's what it looks like. God, don't you know who you're getting involved with, with Jonathan Smith? That's reckless love. He's going to hurt you. He's going to be unfaithful. He's not going to... And God knew all along, looks reckless to you. It's his character. It's who he is. It's what he does. He loves. And then we're reminded by the prophet in 2024 that God's redemption plan means God has come to the rescue. So here's how I'd like to, before our, our hosts come back, I want to pray with you. And uh, there is something about humbling yourself. And language I mentioned, redemption or restoration plan of God always starts with repentance. And I know that's not a popular word in 2024. But re repentance is not being sorry. Because I'm sorry for many things I do, but I'm not going to change doing them. I'm probably going to repeat them. Repentance means I am changing. I'm, I'm changing a direction. So I'm going to let go of something. And so I imagine in a room like this, I imagine there's some people that would like to begin a relationship to follow Jesus. And I imagine there's a lot of us who are followers of Jesus that if we are honest in this moment and we searched our heart like the psalmist said, we might be willing to say, I've forgotten God in places of my life. Or worse yet, I've been fabricating a God that fits my political spectrum, that fits my theology, that fits my lifestyle, that fits me. And maybe we need to come to a place to say, God, uh, I'm the clay. You're the potter. I'm the creation. You're the creator. I want to know you for who you really are. And I, just as you take me as I am, I'm going to bow my knee to who you are. So something I find helpful is a physical expression of what I'm trying to do on the inside of my life. And if it's helpful to you, you can do it. You don't have to. But sometimes I'll hold my hands in front of me. And it's a way of me kind of holding my life before God. If that's helpful to you, Maybe, maybe you need to do something physical to express something going on inside of yourself. And I'm just going to say a simple prayer. First, for those who are followers of Jesus in this room. God, we acknowledge today that your ways are not ours. And God, we are prone to wander. Sometimes they they're just feel like micro movements and sometimes macro shifts in our life but they move us further away from who you are. And God, if we're honest, we're guilty, God, of forgetting you conveniently in certain moments. Forgetting you, God, when we feel your provision and you've sustained us and we think it's us. And God, even fabricating versions of you that fit us. So in this moment, we ask that you'd forgive us. And God, we choose a different direction. Reveal yourself as you are, not who we want you to be. God, we want to love who you are more than even what you give. Help us to trust you. Holy Spirit, search our hearts. If there's anything in us that's offside, God, just illuminate it and help give us the strength to follow in your path. Now, for anyone here that maybe you're not following Jesus right now and you want a moment of surrender, you want to experience God's love. You know there's judgment, there's justice, but you want God's love, you want his faithfulness, you want the redemption that he promised you. 
you know, it starts and it's hard. It just starts by acknowledging we're the ones that are offside. So if this prayer helps you, you pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I am a sinner. I have done things, God, that have not only harmed me, I know it's harmed others and it's put a barrier between you and me. And I want to experience your love. Thank you for coming after me again and again and again. God, I want to be your child. Forgive me. Fill me with your spirit and help me to walk in your way. I want to walk the Jesus way today. In your name, amen. Love you, church.